All right, thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you, Jenny. You're one of my favorite people of all space and time, one of my favorite writers, and uh, one of my favorite human beings. Also, um, did you get in your Pedialyte workout today? Because I definitely got mine. <laughs> I, I uh, Jenny and I do the same. Before you're going. <laughs> Um, so this is like a new thing. Uh, I wrote it like two weeks ago and I read it for um, Lambda Literary. And I'm just going to read it again. Um, I just want to say to my unsafe space group chat, can you stop texting me right now? Because I can't read the, the, the <laughs> I can't read the piece if you're texting me. Um, <clears throat> it's called, I'm writing this in the middle of a heat wave in LA during the 2020 pandemic lull sob. It's 95 degrees. I'm sweating off my Kiehl's tinted moisturizer. I don't think I deserve air conditioning generally, so all my fans are on full blasts. It's week seven of quarantine. I've been calling it the core core for whimsy. It helps. I have a Zoom with the Scream Queen team, a podcast I co-host about scary movies. I wash my hands. I tell them it's really hard watching scary movies right now. I can't consume anything with tension. Roy is sending me a Marco Polo about where to store potatoes. I wash my hands. My mom texts me something that I'm ignoring because if I respond too soon, she'll send 15 more texts in a row. And you know that's right. <laughs> I'm at a house party with Lauren. We like to play its version of Pictionary because neither of us are particularly good at drawing. It launches us into giggle fits. It helps. It helps, but my body knows she's not in front of me. I hate cooking. I suck at it. I wrote a whole book about it. I did a lot of research on it. I washed my hands. I have an interview on Instagram Live with a chef. He says, you know so much about cooking, but you can't cook. I say, yes, it's a Greek tragedy. I live. My doctor is about to send, or my director is about to send me her pass on my script. Without saying too much, the main character is named Tommy and he's from a reservation in Southern California who lives in Brooklyn and is a poet. I have imagination. I read my mom's texts. She tells me how to scramble eggs. She tells me how to make tortillas. I just want fuzzy comfort. I wash my hands. I tell her to look through old photos because the Scream Queen team wants a pic of me as a kid in ho a Halloween costume for Instagram promo. The thin membrane over my wobbly panic thins. My furniture deals group chat is talking about our enemies. I wash my hands. We talk about ain't shit men. When lockout started, when lockdown started, I told them, I love y'all, but I'm not reading your quarantine essays. Writing this is hard. It's the first thing I've written in seven weeks. It's a quarantine essay. I convinced producer Alex to do an hour's worth of Tracy Anderson DVD workouts on YouTube with me every day. Tracy time, we text each other each afternoon. It helps. Mom texts me old school picture day pics. I think it's second grade. I have silver teeth and a res mullet. My unsafe space group chat is talking about BMs. They always do, by the way. My hail paymon group chat is talking about midsummer again. Mom texts me a picture of Papa and his wild bunch jacket. My house party with Marcos and Tazba, which we call house party dolls is tectonic in laughter. Then it ends. I'm in my living room again. I turn off the lights. I lay in bed. I wash my hands. I wash my hands. I wash my hands. Ryan sends me a Marco Polo reminiscing on the universal gay demon pish posh about, a young, about being young and loving a straight guy. Ryan is six feet 100. We used to have a flirty thing, but now we have a friendly one. In my Food for Thought group chat, the gaggle is all caps about the new Tracy Ellis Ross, about the middle-aged singer who wants to record some more bops. It helps. Whoa, Lord in heaven, does it help. Mom texts me a pic of preschool me on my old bed with all my stuffed animals at attention. I liked seeing their eyes at night. I felt less alone. I FaceTime with Nikki. She's my favorite photographer. I wash my hands. She said it's hard making art. It's Monday. It's Saturday. It's the 5th. It's the 15th. We end the chat tipsy drunk saying, let's have another one. I wipe down my groceries. 
I wash my masks in the tub. There's the one for when I get the mail or take out the trash. There's the one for my run. I go to the bathroom. I shut the door. I turn off the lights. I sing. The pounding slows down and I smile like I full on grin. I'm sweating off my tinted moisturizer again. Joe is the virologist. He says that we've been isolating long enough that we can start to open our social circle by one, as long as we trust they've done the same. I mean, it's more than one, but one had a nice rhyme, so I chose that word. I'm writing. It's my dominion. Morgan is my plus one. It takes me three Janet Jackson songs to walk to her house. Her dog barks a lot, but it likes me now. I want to cry. I'm in the same room with someone else, with someone I love. Mom texts me a pic of her and grandma at the table playing guitar. These aren't what I asked for, but I can't ask for more. I think of little me after bedtime, sitting in my sleep shirt in the door frame, listening to mama and grandma making music in the other room. I fall asleep like this, comforted, and mama would lift me back to bed by herself. I wash my hands. I Zoom my therapist. I do cry. It helps. It helps. It helps. Thank you. Also, this reading this is very hard because my screen is so cracked that I can barely get any of the words out. So the fact that I got through it all is a miracle penny. Tommy, that was incredible. Okay. Tommy, thank you so much for you're the only person I could have ever wanted and ever dreamed of to do this book launch with because, um, well, you know this, but I'm going to tell the whole world, but because I didn't really want to write poetry anymore after a certain point, and it was Tommy Pico's poems that made me feel like I could and I should. So it all comes back to here. Um, I'm gonna read a few poems from my baby first birthday. It got really um, waterlogged. I don't know if you guys can see. I'd always, um, I'd always break my favorite possessions or or fuck them up in some way. Like I'd always crack my CDs, and I feel like hurting something is a way of loving it. Um, but hurting something to an extent. I'm working on that. So I kind of hurt this book by accident because I love it. I'm gonna read the first poem from this book. Um, it's sectioned off into four seasons, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And I'll read um, a little bit from each section. Uh, okay. This is called, I keep thinking there is an August and um, this is the fall section. I keep thinking there's an August. If there is an August, then there is an August. I would probably write every day, but some days I get caught up rubbing my pussy, checking for pimples. Green ones pop on their own when I need to come or when I'm flicking cum out. Beautiful white globs that dry midair. I would be lazier than this, but then it would be celestial, a star in midsummer summer solstice long gone. The weird feeling of being alone, of consummating love. Why do my friends look forward to the best day of their lives? Do they secretly wish they were already dead? Do I? Does he? Do all of us already know something of death? The next life, the old world, in the old country, they ate the horses they rode on and no one said anything stupid, like how life is both impossible and happening at the same time. No one spoke through the ground to touch God. That was the old country where my mother is from, where you're from, your mother studied my mother. Your recreational sports came from our rivers. Your houses were decorated with objects so rare. My people have only heard about them in songs passed down by the one family member who befriended a European traveler. Why me, your people cried while visiting the old country, for I have never been the place where I was first touched. A sudden bloom of algae in the ancient lake 
where all the animals touched skin to skin, fur to fur, paw to paw, fin to fin, mount to mount, hole to hole, and became family. Um, I'm gonna read from Winter. Um, this is a poem, I've talked about this poem a few times, but why not talk about it again? Um, this poem, uh, I was commissioned to write this poem and I was really excited because I haven't been commissioned very often to write poems and it was for like a big fancy publication and it came with a big fancy um, check. And I was like, yes, I'm that, I'm that poet now who gets um, paid nicely for poems. I am a reed. Um, and I was commissioned to write a poem about climate change and global warming. So I wrote these two poems and the editor got back to me and was like, um, I'm really sorry, but our readership is one that really enjoys luxury products and we are worried your poems will alienate them. Um, do you think you could revise them so that um, they would find it more palatable? Um, it was impossible, as, as you all can probably guess, um, but I ended up publishing them somewhere else. So this is called TED Talk. And I always wanted to give a TED Talk, but I'm just not inspirational enough. Um, so you guys have to help me with that. TED Talk. Money will build anywhere there's a view or a coastline. All those tangled shrubs and thorny bushes your ancestors cut through centuries ago to claim in the name of a queen and a king with foul-smelling hair. These days, even the ecotone between the living and the dying has to be privatized and sold at auction. All the steps between next year and the first human year ever recorded melted so fragrantly, it became stylish to be poetic for the end of the world. Everyone's collecting coins on every interface, a thousand identical posts about 2019 being the year of paper straws and reusable cups. This was in 2018, remember? when um, that was what people were worried about. Indigo dying in Kyoto is the new 36 hours in Tbilisi. All the people with phones don't think twice about buying onboard Wi-Fi on their way to the latest Caribbean island, still recovering from last year's hurricanes. Would it be so wrong to wish everyone with global entry be grounded until extinction is off the table? I don't think I can date another digital nomad or a normie with a dog who doesn't know what it's like to be too poor to buy their way out of disaster. Why do the rich treat blame like it's obscenity or a fossil? Is it because they hate seeing blood? Think that they are noble for taking little showers and using silicone at the farmer's market? I have never seen someone forgive themselves as elaborately as the wealthy. Everyone who paid for their wellness is infecting the rest of us. And yes, I am sick, 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 and want to sterilize all the ruinous overseers, though it is not like me to dream so much. I have managed to hoard something that cannot be replicated. It will die when I die. Let no one say we didn't try to let a different kind of life bloom. And let no one say we didn't touch what was there from the beginning. Is it was impossible to make that poem a happy experience for people of luxury products. Um, I'm gonna read two short poems from Spring. Uh, the first one is called, I feel nothing but hatred, 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 hatred. It turns you on until you know me. Come here, I say, get to know me already. Uh, this poem goes out to um, Victoria Ruiz, a good friend of both me and Tommy of the Downtown Boys, incredible poet and musician, um, soon to be public defender and lawyer, um, and a person who always loves the people. She wrote this poem um, with me. It's called Jenny's Trying slash Victoria's Theme. But I am not an easy woman. And why would you want to be? Okay, I'm gonna read one last poem and then we're gonna chat. <laughs> um, this poem is from Summer. 
and it's kind of like an end of summer poem. And um, I don't really like it when people explain their poems before reading it, which is why I'm gonna subject you to a tiny little explanation. Um, well, I'm just gonna say that um, I wrote this poem, like I, I, I got a writing residency for the first time in my life as a writer after writing for what felt like decades and decades. And um, it turns out um, success is also painful as is failure. <laughs> And um, six and 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 happiness is it's very uncomfortable. So that's what I'm going to say about this poem. It's called "Under the Chiming Bell." In the lower Piney Creek Valley, I learned to move as ghosts do. After 35 years of belching, I finally qualify as a trophy. In the woods, I am mostly small, insignificant. In love with nothing and no one, boredom is a kind of armor, capitalism no longer contagious. Seeing with my own eyes each raindrop ceasing to exist, still I fear birth as much as death. The non-consent of existence will never be resolved in no lifetime. Has anyone lived through someone else's ending or just me? It is so weird being allowed to enter, not as a servant, but as a guest. The crudeness of patronage, all those childhood prayers wasted essentially. In the end, I was not too beautiful for this. Failed to be much of an exception at all. At least I can still dream to possess the kind of face often inscribed into archways, mid scream like a gargoyle with nothing better to do. The holy don't need us, wretches of a different order, looking for someone or nothing. I was supposed to be staff, and then everything changed, and it didn't even matter that I was born wrong. Will someone tell someone who I am? Will someone please, please, please tell me? All right, that concludes the reading portion. <laughs> Yay, thank you. That was so good. Is it weird, Tommy? Have you gotten used to reading without hearing any feedback whatsoever? Um, yes. I mean, have I got used to it? No. I, I have come to accept it. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, I, we talked about um, kind of like having audience and crowds and holding space and that kind of stuff and touring and, 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 and having faces to look into. And mm -hmm. I'm, how are you adjusting? It's weird because um, I, I always felt so, I never felt nervous to do readings in public. I always felt so comfortable and I always felt so anonymous and I feel so nervous doing these readings on Zoom and Instagram live because first of all, I'm staring at my freaking face, which it's like the last thing I want to be doing <laughs> as I'm like reading poems that I wrote in like the pits of like aloneness and, and, and you know darkness and feeling and there's something really weird because I just I don't I don't feel anonymous even though I think because the readers are now anonymous I feel so not anonymous and I loved the feeling of reading and feeling like I was sharing something without sharing myself. Like I, there was something so vulnerable and unvulnerable about reading in public. And there's something that's like inversely vulnerable and unvulnerable about reading in these spaces. I don't know. And it's, it's interesting also because I realized how much I relied on people laughing and that gave me like certain hits of like, I'm doing a good job. I'm entertaining people. I have a use. And now like, I, there's no laughter to be heard <laughs> like and that's changing things in a good way yeah I mean I especially because I think we both use humor in our work um to I mean perhaps differently but like that's so so, so much a part of it and and I like I love punchlines I love writing them I love the la like making somebody laugh is like one of the best feelings in the whole world and to be deprived of that um is is sort of like it's not my favorite thing in the world to say that much. 
but yeah, dealing. Uh, you kind of addressed this a little bit earlier, um, but I wanted to ask you, because the first time we started to really hang out, um, you told me that you were done with poetry. And I've also said that at times, and then all of a sudden I'm writing a new book, and I'm like, fuck, what? I, I thought, I mean, I totally was done. I, it was for real done. So I'm curious, like, about um, what kind of drove you away and what is um, leading you back. Yeah, this is like one long conversation that I feel like we'll have our whole lives from birth till death or something. I feel like when we first started, well, when I first met, when I first met you, Tommy, it was at, um, it was like a basement queer club in Bushwick. Do you remember that place? Was it called Spectrum? Spectrum, I think, and uh, I think it was uh, like Ben Fama's book release. Yeah, it was Ben Fama's um, book release. Shout out to Ben Fama. And I remember just, this is how I felt a lot of the times. In 2012 to 2014, I got really into poetry and, well, I published my first poetry book, Dear Jenny, Where I'll Find, and I did this one poetry reading um, at this place called Goodbye Blue Monday, which doesn't, I don't think it exists anymore. It's in that weird, like, bed Bushwick, um, triangle with, like, another neighborhood, and I remember I did Like, this, directly under a train. Directly under a train, it would, like, rattle every five to eight minutes, and I did this reading, and it kind of led to me doing more readings, and there was just this two-year period where I did, like, two to three readings a week, um, and I know that you were doing the same thing, and I felt very like it was like a dream and also a nightmare because I just remember all these dark bars and me like drinking too much and feeling really alienated and feeling like supported in all the wrong ways and feeling like all I wanted to do was after that reading was like go and hang out with my friends. But it was but I didn't have any I didn't have any friends who went to poetry readings and my friends and the people who went to poetry readings were like this class of like mostly white people who I had never I just never felt at home like being around them I, I didn't take the classes they took and I didn't have the same financial literacy they had even if they were you know living off of ramen and um, cigarettes at the time, they had this whole like identity behind them that I didn't have. And I felt very alienated. And I felt like the more I succeeded in that space, the more useless it felt. And it got to this point where I just felt there has to be a word for when like a dominant culture who hates that you are successful has to accept that you're incredibly radiant and successful and electrifying because that's what I felt for like two years. And it's a terrible way to feel, to feel like you're really good and people really resent you for being really good. And, but because they don't want to be that white poet who only curates a night of six to eight white poets, they have to invite you because they actually don't know anyone else other than themselves. And that was just like a dynamic I wanted to get out of. And that's partially on me because I didn't do my due diligence to find like poets that I fucked with. And that's why it was such an amazing moment at Spectrum at Ben Fama's poetry launch when, I, when you got up there and you started reading. Um, it, I was just like, wow, Oh, where have you been my whole life? Like you were my poetry soulmate that I've been looking for. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I I have to say similarly. I I felt very. I I, I kind of I got to New York in two thousand and six. I think that's when I like. I mean, I, I moved there in like two thousand and two to start school, but I didn't really like explore until like 2006, 2007. And I really wanted to be part of the scene. Like I really, really wanted to go there and find my like like Black Mountain or my New York school or my Chelsea Hotel or something. I wanted to find that so desperately. And, and I felt it was so like, I, I never, it's like that frustrating feeling of feeling so close to something and so far away at the same time. And, yes, yes. And um, that's when I formed my own collective um, with like friends of mine. And 
so I, I retreated from like the like quote unquote poetry scene in New York from 2008 to like 2013 when I kind of finally dissolved the collective. And it was in that time, I think that was kind of 2013, 2014 was like kind of pivotal for I think New York poetry scene yeah. because 2014 was when I met Morgan Parker. You know what I mean? And that was like- Morgan Parker. Yes, and, and we have like, and we started a read, we started Poets of Attitude because we were both like, why are we the one? Like, why are we the one spice in this gumbo? You know what I mean? Why are we the one thing that's like keeping this whole reading together? What if we had readings where everyone was really good? <laughs> you know what I mean? Everyone yeah. was, and not just like, not just like, um, not like that their, their, their work was good, but that they read it as if they wrote it and as if they cared about it. Because there was a kind of dispassion in poetry yeah. that I was so fed up with. Yes. And it's like a stiltedness and a distance. And I was like, you're in front of people. You know what I mean? Like there is an audience that came here to spend time with you. There are they could be doing anything else, but they're here with you. And that felt so disrespectful to me, you know? Totally, totally. And Yeah, and so and was, there was, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, <laughs> no, poets with attitude, it's like, that was, I mean, it was the best reading series um, I'd ever been to because everyone, like, everyone showed up and, and performed. I think, and, and there was, there's, there's something about poetry being a completely unprofitable art form <laughs> that you'd think <laughs> would make it really revolutionary, but actually, there's an opportunity to take advantage of the fact that no one gives a fuck about poetry and make it really revolutionary. And there's also an opportunity to double down and make it totally inaccessible and totally elitist and totally like kind of like guarded on all sides. And I feel like we both went to those poetry meetings where I'm like, why is it so important to this poet on stage to alienate everyone with their supreme intellect and their supreme education? And and why why won't they like why won't they let us be part of it? <laughs> and so I just wanted to be with other poets who who wanted to like to like share and create some things like with others and, and invite others in. And it's really cool that you, like, it's really cool to me that, it's cool to me and also it's how it always is. It is like, there has to be another word also for when you think um, you're gonna finally be amongst like outsiders who understand what it's like to be on like the fringes of blah, 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 blah. And then it turns out those people on the fringe are just like the center of something else that you never wanted to be part of. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, makes <laughs> that makes too much sense, Jenny. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious like about, okay, so, you know, for, first of all, shout out to Tin House. They're like really killing it right now. Cause it's like you, me, Morgan, Hanif, um, Erica Dawson, Destiny Birdsong. I mean, the, the, the poets, the, the curing, the, the poets that are on the press right now are just really, not only like some of my favorite writers, but some of my favorite people and best friends. <laughs> and so there's something really special about that inclusion. And, and in talking about inclusion, I also wanted to ask you about your writing in the sense that, and this is a question I get all the time, and I wonder if, if you have a similar answer or if you think about it similarly to me, but um, I, I, I get asked about the, um, the, like internet speak or the common language or the you know like the, the that that I use in my work um and I'm curious if you are asked about that and it, what you think about it yeah I get asked about I get asked about like um the profanity that um appears in my poetry and fiction a lot I get asked a lot um about there's always like a tinge of like, am I trying to shock or what, or, or like, why am I slumming it? There's always that sort of tinge to the questions. Um, 
in this book in particular, I did take like literal text conversations, which I know you also do in your poetry. Um, because I mean, we've talked about this, like texting is a poetic form. There's line breaks built into texting. Unless you are one of those completely scary sociopaths who write full sentences with punctuation and um, capitalization. I mean, I, I wish I didn't know such people existed, but I know they do. But most people text in a way that it's a natural poetic form because um, it doesn't necessarily follow cause and effect also when you text. Like sometimes you're responding to something that was said like, you know, 10 lines ago because of the nature of how fast texting happens and the way that we text. So there was something that was just like a ready-made art form about texting that I loved. But I think the deeper thing, I think we're like both suspicious of having like total and utter reverence of the English language. I mean, you've written about this in your tetralogy. Um, that that is like a language that was used to literally annihilate, destroy, and um, you know colonize like your people, and it, it's a I don't know it's 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 a very interesting thing to write poetry in the language I know best, which is English, which is also a language that has um, been like I've been at odds with it. it it's, it's a language that I had to, it, it, it's something that I never quote unquote mastered um, because you can't really master the master's language. You can only, <laughs> you know, um, and it's, it's, it's something, I don't know, for whatever, for all these different reasons, um, I, I was made to feel like I wasn't good at it. And um, and the people that I care about most were also made to feel like they weren't good at it. And I know that it's really important to me to write in a way where my mom can read um, my poems and she never formally learned English. Um, and I know not everyone has that concern, but I do. Shout out to my mom. I think she's in here somewhere. Um, my mom's in here too, just FYI. Oh my God, <laughs> shout out to mom. <laughs> but I think there's also this feeling I have of like, can you only love me when I'm behaving and I'm sweet and I'm lovely and I don't make like a big deal um, about anything and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of like, kind of like quiet and captive or can you love me in like all my forms? That's like something that I always am interested in exploring. I also think a lot about in, when, when I'm getting asked these questions in interviews or um, in classrooms about the tech speak or the accessibility of the work, it's hard not to take that as like a part of a class conversation. Yes. You know, it's, it's like, and, and then, so it's like, is it, okay, so it's not classy for me to use language that I use with my friends. Is that what you're saying? Like, or, or that like, it's it, like, that in order to write poetry, you have to have a kind of vocabulary that totally. you paid for. Uh, totally. That doesn't sa that doesn't track, my friend. Like that sounds like your issue, not mine. <laughs> exactly. And some of the most violent people, like, don't curse and don't use, um, you know, any kind of slang, and they are the epitome of evil and they have perfect diction and perfect grammar and know the difference between an M dash and a semicolon and they want to literally kill us. So mm -hmm. like, it's a little bit hard for me to, to respect that at times. Yeah. <laughs> it's also like, writing is really hard and it, I don't like it. So I try to make it as easy as possible on myself. So uh, the other thing is that like, I think about intimidation when I think about poetry and when I think about that and as it relates to um, like institutions, like educational institutions, because I was similarly always made to feel very, very stupid in, yeah. in classrooms. And it became difficult for me to raise my hand and answer because like I was unclean and dumb, you know? And it took me a long time to realize that education and intelligence aren't the same thing. Totally. And that like, I do have, that I am smart. And, but like, so once like taking the language into my own hands, 
in addition to wanting it to, like you said, be accessible to my family. Like I did my, I wanted my mother to read my books too. You know what I mean? I want my cousins to read my books. When they have my books and they take a picture of them and send it to me, I'm like, I did the right thing. I stuck to my guns. I didn't allow that person in that workshop to alter the way that I wrote my own story, you know? And, and, I, and a part of that is that like, we are writing all the time and writing emails or writing text messages and tweets and all that kind of stuff. I feel like the world is fodder for poetry. So why not that part too? Yeah. I love, I love that. I love that so much. Um, I remember we were in like 10th grade or something. We were reading an E.E. E. Cummings poem <laughs> and I raised my hand, like the teacher was like, so what does this line mean? And I raised my hand and I was like, I think it means blah, blah, blah. And this guy literally was like, wrong. He was like, this line has been proven to mean blank. And I was like, wait, but who, <laughs> how do you know? Shut that? up, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I always found that so hilarious that he was like, no, I have the key and you didn't answer with the right, you know, you, you didn't have the right answer. And I also remember um, in college, I had this, uh, I was assigned this like writing mentor um, and she had like told me something like, she was like, have you ever considered reading, um, what's that book called? Like Shrunk and White Elements of Style? Um, it's like that classic book about grammar and commas. And I just really wish that I could have said like, have you ever considered reading a little bit about the people that I've been writing about this entire semester that you can have <clears throat> no insight into and give me the most terrible advice about because you literally know nothing? Yeah. Have, like you, have you ever thought about um, <laughs> thinking something that you don't say out loud? Like, <laughs> you don't have to be talking. <laughs> Yeah, fuck grammar. Hey, Henry. Um, yeah, no, so I, you know, I mean, that's why it's important that you exist and because um, like me reading your poetry is also, it gives me like more permission and more confidence to write the way I want to write. I Same, I, mean, I feel that, I feel that way about you too. I, I got an early copy of this book in October and I read it on the way to the Princeton Poetry Festival. I, uh, they had, like, they had a car come pick me up in Brooklyn, drive me to Princeton. <laughs> and so in that drive, and it was like a fancy, a big old, I don't know, I, don't, I, I actually pretended there for a second that I knew the makes and models of cars that I don't. It was a big car. It was a huge car. It was a huge car. Um, you know, and I like them regular size. Uh, so <laughs> I was in the back and I was reading the book and, I, they dropped me off and I, I didn't even check into the hotel because I was still reading and I didn't want to not, I wanted to finish it all in one go. And, mm -hmm. and um, so immediately I saw, and the structure, you structured it seasonally. Mm. And I did the same thing for my books. One was a summer book, one was a fall book, one was a winter book, one was a spring book. Um, and so I'm curious, like, what led you to that structure? Yeah, I was, I was noticing, there's so many um, cool like parallels between our books, and I, I was just reading. I was rereading Feed before this event, um, and the the spring jumped out. Um, well, I kind of organized. I, I wrote these poems over a long period of time, from 2012 to 2018, and then in 2019, I kind of looked over all of these poems, and I I. I think similar to you, you always want to give your readers like a journey to go on, like this sort of like epic journey to be on. And I wanted to kind of give the readers a journey and, and something of, of a story and a narrative and a tale. And I just felt like the things I was writing about, I was writing about like repetition and how we think like, that's it. I'm never going to be sad again. And then mm -hmm. you up the next day and you're like, God damn it. I just found a new way of being sad that <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know existed. <laughs> You're like, what can this end? And, and in fact, it, it doesn't end. And I think one of the most despairing feelings is feeling like you're, 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 you're repeating the same cycle again and again. And, um, and in fact, we're not, I don't think repeating the same cycle, but there are cycles 
um, but it's but it is different each time, and it made me just think of like literally like life on earth like there are cycles, mm -hmm. there are seasons like fall comes again and again winter comes again and again spring comes again and again each season has like a personality um attached to it but we also it also interacts with our personalities summer is like a, a time of like manic energy and it's supposed to be a time where all you want to do is like show skin and be outside and like you know touch the elements but some of us like are you know under our covers like sobbing all summer and it's made all the worse because everyone outside is like um so excited to be out there um and winter is supposed to be a time of like contraction and rest and hibernation but because um we live in the killing machine that is capitalism like th there's no rest <laughs> there's there's no time to rejuvenate there's no time to store up and so i kind of wanted to pay um respect to this idea of like there's a season for everything but also like we return to seasons again, and again. Kind of but i also enjoyed reading it i mean i just enjoyed reading it um uh, but I, I i i liked the way that the voice changed over the course of the book and mm -hmm. and didn't um and like I, like i felt i felt the momentum build up you know what i mean i felt like that by the end i was just like we are we are at a, a at a pace you know what i mean I, my heart was pacing I, I felt so a part of the world of it and and um and i'm curious in in the editing process like how you built that arc yeah you read it so deeply. <laughs> I wanted to start with someone, the, the speaker of these poems, just being so overwhelmed and so like wanting to hide, but also coming off of a summer. Because I think the interesting, I hate fall, and I know there's a lot of fall love. Um, <laughs> these streets but i hate fall because i'm always thinking forward so when fall comes i'm just thinking winter like cold i'm not gonna be able to take it how am i gonna get through this um but i know people love like the coziness of fall but i kind of like the very beginning of fall when sometimes it still feels like summer and like people are still dressing like hoishly, but also get getting really cold at 7 p.m. <laughs> and there's still that leftover, like, you know, radiant energy of summer, but also the disappointment of what the summer wasn't. Like maybe you didn't have that like summer fling or you had that summer fling and it sucked. You know, there, there's like a lot of like, there's a lot of, I think, there's a lot of pressure for summer to be a fun time. And sometimes uh, there's that feeling in like September where it was like, oh, wasn't that fun? So I kind of started off um, the collection with like this come down almost from a summer and, um, and having to accept that like, just having to like be alone and not having fun and distraction again but also the speaker of these poems you're right they start off very i think i don't want to say nihilistic but sort of like named with pain and um and at the same time they're trying really really hard to heal and they're trying to heal and and like get to a place um, by the end of the collection where they're like open to love and connection. And I think the thing about healing is that it probably takes longer than we have in our mortal lifetimes because the shit that was done, as you know, and as many people know, it started before we, we were even, even born. So how the fuck are we supposed to heal the stuff that happened eight centuries ago <laughs> in our puny little lifetimes? And yet we have to, and yet we must, because I don't wanna live my life in pain from the moment I'm born until the moment I die. I have to try. And so like the speaker of these poems is sort of like, yeah, I got a, I got a lot on my plate right now, but I have to try. And like you try and then like you fall back and suddenly, you know, you fall eight centuries back, you fall eight days back, you fall eight months back, and then you like take one step forward into the place of tomorrow. And that's kind of the energy I think we're talking about. And there's like also this I like 
I, I don't like I it's never like this I don't ever think that the speaker is like completely different like I don't think the like the speaker seems very consistent in in their um desire to get better and yep. also their understanding that it might not happen yeah <laughs> and I just like that combination it, it, it seems so um hopeful to me and I felt like deeply that like the what we can do maybe we can't heal ourselves totally but we can heal laterally like with yeah. each other and like I felt like I was with you or the person I felt like I was with the writer and we were holding each other down I love that that's so deep because I mean it hasn't really been talked about this way but this is like these are like love poems, and I don't just mean like romantic love poems, but, but love in all the ways of love, because I, I do think that true love, you know, there was a time when I was really angsty and really teeny, um, cough, cough, like one month ago, where I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of like, it's like that Fiona Apple song where she was like, I resent you for being raised right, and she's, um, are you into Fiona Apple? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, vegetable cutters, right? Um, but you know where she's kind of like talking about like she's 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 like singing about like resenting people who never had to struggle, and and that's also like a fiction because we'd like to believe that there are people in this world who've never had to struggle. But it's also true that the structures of this world means that some people have had to struggle so much more than others. And there was a time where I was like, "Fuck everyone who doesn't know what it's like to be in the deepest pits of despair. I hate you, and um, I don't want to like know you." And um, and then I kind of got over that and and because when I was in that place, I was like, oh, only those people get to, to, to like experience love and relationships, people who've never been burned, people who've never been wounded. But actually that was like a dream that I had that was like an excuse for why I wasn't trying to forge those relationships. Because in fact, it's like you said, like, yeah, fuck it, we're wounded and fuck it, we not, might, might not be able to heal it in our lifetime. But there's something so deep and loving about someone saying like i see you're wounded i'm wounded too like i like you still <laughs> like like let's hang out let's let's keep talking and that is that is like a lyric that is a poetic lyric and that is also friendship and that is like and that's why i also dedicated this book of poetry to my friends because i think that is healing laterally for me mm -hmm. it's like meeting other people who are like yeah i get it i want to like punch the wall and like eat the like casing and uh, but like let's just try let's just try yeah um do you want to get into some of these q a's uh oh i'm scared yeah should we do it do it do it do it okay <laughs> first question Oh, Joe needs to go to sleep. <laughs> Joe, Joe, the science guy. Shout out to Joe, the science guy. Um, the science ho. The science ho. I, I have, I have learned a lot from from Joe, and um, his Twitter feed. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll read. Uh, someone asked Kia. Myers, I'm sorry if I said your name incorrectly. Um, what do you feel is the biggest transition from your last book of poetry? Ooh, I, I cringe because um, I'm curious, Tommy, like when you read your old poems that like from just any time ago, like how do you, are you, do you still feel connected to them? Um, I see usually like depending on like what it's coming from, um, before my first book when I was reading like all those short poems I read them now and I'm like he's really trying hard to find his thing you know he's trying really really hard to find footing in this medium and I see the form but you didn't quite stick the landing my friend <laughs> yes, yes. I, I feel that I, I feel I, I feel like I was I was trying something new in my first book of poetry. I feel like I had no idea what I was doing. I also feel like I was wrong about things. And um, I think it's, it's, 
I don't want to say it's okay to be wrong. It's not okay or not okay. I just want to say it's good to grow. It's good to like yeah. see old things and cringe because ideally that means you've grown. And ideally mm -hmm. that means it like I don't want 10 years from now to feel like, wow, I was so great like 10 years ago. Um, because I want to be like changing. <laughs> I, I don't want to like stay a fossil. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing. Um, other questions. Um, how have the last two years been for you since Sour Heart? This is from Paige Pre Prevost. Um, it's been really interesting and maybe connected to the last question. A big difference between 2012 when my first book came out and now is that I'm not, I'm not struggling to be a writer in the same way that I was when I was, you know, in my 20s. If I want to publish something, I pretty much can. And that's like an enormously huge difference. And as like, I think everyone here knows, it's really hard to let go of like old identities, especially identities that are based on like, feeling not good enough or feeling like a failure, you think it would be easy to step into like a shiny, glossy place of like, I'm great. It seems actually, like every self-help author seems to think so. I yeah. like, I don't think we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> Su success is like very painful because you don't, if you don't have the foundation, like to, it's like if you spent your whole life feeling unsuccessful and feeling like a failure and feeling unhappy, it's not like comfortable to step into a different um, place. And my friend Karen Mahajan, who I think might be here, shout out to Karen, he had said to me, um, great fiction writer, and um, he had said to me something like, you know, just as failure is something you have to process, success is something to process too. And that really that really like resonated with me because I actually hadn't tried to process that. Um, and I actually like didn't want to process that because I think a part of me wanted to like stay wretched. Like a part of me felt the most comfortable um, struggling to be heard. And that's mm -hmm. just simply not my reality anymore. And I have to acknowledge that. And I have to like find a way to exist in like this new reality. I don't know and what you said, it was like comfort, right? It was like, it was comfortable to be something that you kind of had rallied an identity around and to find, yeah. to feel that shifting. It's like, it, it, you, like, you're right. You'd think it would be like, oh, damn, the sun is out. Like, I'm good. Like, yay, we're here. And it's more like, do I dare to eat a peach? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. 